So I think that um, the situation today is actually more dangerous than uh, the situation was in late February, early March when this conflict began. When the conflict began, I think uh, most people assumed it would be comparatively short and that Russia would win one way or another. We at Crisis Group uh, predicted a, that the Ukrainians would resist quite substantially, but uh, we did not predict uh, this, really, which, which is what we've had. We've, we're in our third month, and the Russian forces have not done well, right? Um, for all the credit we should give the Ukrainians, a big part of the reason that this war has gone on so long and that the Russians have been forced uh, to regroup, change their military aims, shift their focus from the country as a whole to the east, is that their plans were unrealistic and their fighting forces appeared not to be adequately trained or prepared. Um, so why is the moment more dangerous with a weaker, less capable Russia? Well, the moment's more dangerous with a weaker, less capable Russia because of a number of factors. One is that for the Russians, they've put a pretty big stake on this conflict. And they are, you know, I think for the Russian government, there's a real concern of well, what happens if, we're, if we lose this fight. Um, this, this is a point we're making to Ukraine, to the world. Uh, you know, I don't, the question of how much space they've given themselves to back away is a really important one because they didn't write a lot of space in. And their rhetoric has escalated. They are talking about this being a fight with NATO, with the United States, which are, of course, backing Ukraine. Um, meanwhile, NATO, the United States, the EU, all of these countries that are backing Ukraine have been pouring more and more weapons support and supplies into Ukraine, which is necessary in part because uh, Russia has, detro has destroyed a good bit of the Ukrainian um, military industrial infrastructure, its capacity to build its own weapons to supply itself. Um, but their rhetoric has also escalated. So you're hearing talk of regime change that, you know, this man cannot stay in power about the Russian president. Uh, you are hearing discussions of putting the Russian government on trial for war crimes. So that creates even less space, all right, for the Russians to make a deal and back away. Their options, if they lose, get worse and worse. The other concern here is that with kind of this creeping escalation of the assistance, uh, we get potentially closer to a risk of something that looks more like NATO or US involvement in this conflict. And then you don't have a war between Ukraine, which is backed by Western countries and Russia. You have a war between Western countries, the NATO alliance, uh, which includes the United States and Canada on the one hand and Russia on the other. And that is a very dangerous thing. That is a war between Russia, the country with the most nuclear weapons of any country in the world, and three other nuclear weapon states, including the United States, which is number two. So look, nuclear deterrence is uh, probably a big part of the, re of the reason that NATO member states aren't in this war directly. They don't want a war with Russia because they don't want a nuclear war. And that's how deterrence works. This fear that the war could turn nuclear, that the war could lead to everybody's destruction is what keeps it, you know, that's the idea behind deterrence, that it keeps the lid on. Um, now, from a Russian perspective, it does not want a war with NATO either, right? A uh, war with NATO is existential for it. But if it thinks it's in a war with NATO, then that war is going to be existential sooner or later. Why is that? Well, because NATO is conventionally much more capable than Russia. It's because Russia has been hearing all of this talk of regime change and um, Russia has also seen how NATO member states fight wars, which involve a good bit of destruction and indeed often a change of government and a lot of chaos afterwards. So for Russia, a war with NATO is existential. Russia also would expect that NATO would probably uh, fear Russian nuclear use and therefore would take steps fairly early in the conflict to try to keep Russia from using its nuclear weapons. So go after its command and control capabilities, for instance. So for that reason, there's a certain kind of pressure on Russia in that sort of conflict. It's going to be nuclear eventually. If we, you know, we have a use or lose situation for at least some of the nuclear capability.
Um, and, you know, there's always the chance that if we demonstrate um, resolve with nuclear weapons, they'll back away, they'll realize how dangerous there is how dangerous that situation is. Now, of course, if that happens, uh, you're in, so, you know, you're in a war. How does the war begin? Um, say Russia strikes uh, a convoy that is providing equipment to Ukraine, but on the Polish side uh, of the border. So that's a strike on Poland, which is a NATO member state. Uh, there's a NATO responsive strike on some military facility in Russia. Uh, there's a counter-strike somewhere else. This question of who uses a nuclear weapon first and under what conditions, who knows? But again, kind of you get into the situation where that's a real risk. Now, if Russia uses a nuclear weapon first, my guess is that NATO members would probably not respond with a nuclear weapon, at least initially, um, assuming we're not looking at a full-scale nuclear exchange. Um, but what they might do is target Russian military facilities to try to demonstrate a certain amount of restraint. But again, at that point, those are strikes on the Russian homeland. It's really, really difficult to demonstrate restraint to your adversary in the midst of a war. So I can sit there and think, well, if they've used nuclear weapons and I've responded with conventional weapons, I'm demonstrating restraint. But they may say they, they did this because they don't need to use nuclear weapons. They're capable of taking out my... Um, my military capability with conventional weapons, uh, and that's the point they're trying to make. So what Western states have been doing up until now is trying to strike a balance between providing support to Ukraine and keeping themselves out of something that Russia might see as indeed a direct war with NATO. Uh, so generally, the thought is as long as no NATO troops are shooting at Russian forces, as long as no NATO forces are striking Russian territory, as long as Russia is not stri striking the territory of NATO member states, you're comfortably within that line. The problem is uh, NATO isn't drawing the line, Russia is. And right, so far, you know, so far so good. But again, we've had, um, We've had this escalation of involvement, of activity, of rhetoric, and you do kind of, you look at this and you wonder, okay, so supplying weapons is okay, but does it matter which weapons? Is there a difference between supplying artillery systems and supplying tanks and supplying fighter jets? Uh, and then you say, okay, you're supporting the Ukrainians with intelligence. Um, is there a difference between telling them the Russians are massing all around your borders and telling them this might be a good target to take out, uh, right at the point where the intelligence becomes a battlefield support intelligence? Is that, does that feel more like involvement in the conflict? And again, we don't know, we don't know the answer. We don't know how this actually works uh, because the Russians, I think, don't necessarily know themselves. If you think about the sanctions that were imposed on Russia after it invaded Ukraine in late February, Western states had said there would be sanctions, but they surprised both Russia and themselves with the extent of the sanctions. Now, that means they didn't know in advance. They knew that they would impose sanctions if Russia invaded Ukraine, but they didn't really know how they would respond until Russia did, in fact, launch a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Um, so Russia, too, might not know how it's going to respond to a given situation until it decides it needs to respond to a given situation. And if you have pundits on the television talking about this as a war with NATO, and you've got things that look more and more like it is, in fact, a war with NATO, um, you know, the red line might be not quite where you thought it was. It's not, this isn't arithmetic. It's not if you reach three you've reached three and you've crossed the threshold, but 2.95 is okay. You know, sometimes it's 2.95, sometimes it's 3.05. You don't know until it happens, and that is indeed a very dangerous situation. So Crisis Group has generally supported an effort to take a balanced approach. We do think that um, the future security of Europe will be better assured if Ukraine is supported in this conflict.
uh, we think the security of Europe and the world will be completely destroyed if this conflict escalates to a NATO-Russia war. So it is a really precarious balance to be struck. But what they can be doing to, um, to mitigate the risks of escalation include toning down the rhetoric, right? So less regime change, let's talk of war crimes. By all means, collect the information. By all means, prepare for the, the moment when justice can be served. But threatening the people you're gonna need to negotiate with with a war crimes tribunal is probably not a good tactical move. Uh, instead of escalating the rhetoric and talk about the advantages to Russia of ending this war. Uh, some sanctions presumably could be lifted. Uh, some elements of normalcy could be resumed. And I know that sounds horrible to say, you know, how can you talk about normalcy when they just launched this full-scale invasion? Well, you know, I don't think we're looking at a normal, anything like the old normal anyway. But at some point, you know, you have to accept the reality of the Russia that exists and find ways to make Europe and the world more secure with that. And that is going to mean engaging with them, talking with them, and finding um, finding ways to limit the risks, to mitigate the risks. So, you know, you're going to hear the argument the way you mitigate the risks is through more deterrence, right? It's by frightening them enough. And I would say that has not worked so far. Um, you know, it's, it is a balance, it's, and it is dangerous. I don't have a solution that makes it not dangerous. Um, so we are in the business of trying not to solve the problem, but to make it a slightly less bad problem. So I think there is a certain hope um, among Western states, and probably Ukraine, that the war will be won one way or another fairly soon, that there will be decisive um, successes or failures on the battlefield, and that can shape some kind of a future. Now, this raises a very interesting question of whether what Western states want from this conflict and Ukraine wants from this conflict are the same. And the answer is it depends on which Western states you're talking about and which Ukrainians you're talking about for that matter. But I've heard concerns uh, voiced in Western capitals, both that Ukraine is going to make a deal with Russia that enables Russia to rebuild and rearm and Western states will then need to keep the pressure on Russia that they can't uh, follow Ukraine along such a deal and indeed they should try to discourage Ukraine from making such a deal, on the one hand. On the other hand, I've heard um, Westerners who are concerned that Ukraine will keep fighting and keep dra dragging Western states in and keep increasing the risk of escalation. And in fact, what, Ukraine should try to make a deal earlier and offer concessions. So you hear both of these things uh, from people in the West. And in Ukraine, you hear variations on these things too, though in general, I think the Ukrainians want to see how the fight goes. Um, and, you know, that's, that's what we're doing. We're, we're seeing how the fight goes. The way the fight ends, you know, wishful thinking is not a strategy, right? So one can hope that the Russians come to their senses, take their forces and go home, offer to pay Ukraine reparations, give back Crimea. Um, all that would, you know, be great, but it's very unlikely to happen. So what you're probably looking at is some kind of a deal between the Russians and the Ukrainians that both sides view as temporary, that might even be formally stated as temporary, that they're going to continue discussions of things. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem with that is they both go away thinking, I'm going to build up, I'm going to develop my forces, and I'm going to come back and do this again when I'm ready and when they're not. And that sets the stage for another crisis. And Western states will be thinking two things. One is how do we support Ukraine uh, in making sure it's able to come back and fix this later? And how do we make sure that Russia doesn't have the capability to come back and fix it later? Uh, and add to that concerns about Russian aggression in other countries, which one may think, look, they've just proven themselves unable to easily win a conventional war with Ukraine. Why on earth would they want to take on a NATO member state or really anybody else? If their intelligence was wrong about Ukraine, 
why would they assume that their intelligence is right about any, you know, Moldova or Georgia? But if you're Moldovan or Georgian, you're probably still nervous. And if you're an Eastern NATO member state, in many cases, if you're Poland or Estonia uh, or Latvia or Lithuania, you're also nervous. So there's going to be a lot of interest in NATO in building up um, military forces, uh, particularly on that Eastern flank, uh, having more exercises, carrying out more activities, and certainly keeping sanctions on Russia that keep its military from rebuilding effectively. So some of the sanctions that keep military technologies out of Russia and so forth are likely to stay in place for the foreseeable future, even if otherwise they like the deal that Russia and Ukraine strike. Now, what do you do to make a deal more sustainable? Well, one of the ways you do that is uh, through arms control. Uh, if there's a deal between Ukraine and Russia, it's going to have arms control elements. It's going to tell the Russians and the Ukrainians what forces they can put where under what conditions and in what numbers. If you broaden that uh, to other parts of, um, of Europe uh, and you limit what Russia can put near its borders with NATO member states, and then you also limit what those NATO member states can put near their borders with Russia, what kind of activities and exercises different countries can undertake that others might see as dangerous or might see as cover for preparing for a military operation. Um, all of those sorts of things can actually mitigate risks. Now, it's a tough sell um, under current conditions. There's a lot of anger and frustration, and that tends to push in escalatory directions rather than de-escalatory directions. There's a lot of desire to punish Russia um, and you know, kind of thinking, why, you, know, you don't want to limit your own forces under these conditions. But you know the, the underlying logic of arms control is that you're willing to limit your own forces in exchange for getting to limit your adversaries. So I don't think immediately there is a lot anybody can do other than tone down the rhetoric and try to make the case that this war can end in ways that are acceptable for everybody survivable for everybody. Um, that, this that a defeat in Ukraine for Russia, which let's face it, to some extent, there is not a way out of this where Russia is not at least somewhat defeated in Ukraine, uh, is not existential for Russia. Um, so I think a lot of that is signaling that um, some easing of sanctions is possible when there's a deal. On the Ukrainian side, the Ukrainians have talked about their desire for security guarantees uh, if, if they're to cut any kind of a deal with Russia. The security guarantee means that another country is in fact committed to go to war on Ukraine's behalf. Nobody really wants to do that, again, for all of these reasons that they don't want to fight a war with Russia because that war has very high escalation risks. So how do you square that circle? What can you do that um, makes Ukraine feel more secure, but that does not create increasing escalation risks? Um, there's not a magic solution to this. Uh, there, I think the solution many NATO member states have hit upon is they're going to arm Ukraine to the teeth and continue to support it in that way. That means that any deal will have to include provisions for that while somehow also limiting exactly what happens near the line of separation and near the border with Russia. Um, again, tall orders. Right now, there is not much going on in the way of negotiations other than discussions of humanitarian corridors and prisoner exchanges. Um, I think everybody's waiting to see how the fighting goes. Now, I would say there are a couple of things that could come out of that, right? One, the fighting could start going very well or very poorly for one side or the other. And that could drive the side that's not doing as well to the negotiating table to try to cement whatever gains it has. Um, the other possibility is that the fighting looks like it's about to drag on. And then you have to ask which side has the capacity to stay in the fight. Um, what are the costs of continued attrition? Do they have the people to put into the fight? Do they have the equipment to put into the fight? And there have been a lot of questions about whether Russia is able to maintain um, a long attrition warfare um, 
situation in Ukraine. Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but I certainly look at what we've seen so far, and I have a lot of questions about their capacity to do that. Um, from the Ukrainian standpoint, right, as long as the Western weapons keep coming, they can probably keep it up. Um, you know, even in terms of people, they've got refugees uh, and expats who have been returning to take part. Um, but over time, that also becomes uh, more and more of a problem. So what the sanctions literature will tell you, um, and it's based on the history of sanctions being imposed by many countries, is sanctions work best when they're threatened but don't have to be imposed, where the country that would have been sanctioned said, right, never mind, I'm not going to do that because you threatened me with sanctions. So, you know, you never have to impose the sanctions. Ideally, nobody even knows that you were threatening to impose the sanctions because all of this happened very, very quietly so they don't have to publicly back away from a position. They just don't do the thing, you don't impose the sanctions. That's not where we are now. So we have sanctions that are intended at this point to punish and the hope is that they'll change behavior. At this point, they're not deterring, they're not preventing, they're trying to compel, they're trying to make Russia and Russians change what they're doing now. That's a lot harder. Historically, it doesn't tend to work very well. Um, when it works is when sanctions are flexible, when they're adaptable, when you can offer incentives uh, rather than just say, we're gonna just keep push, putting on more and more sanctions until you change your behavior. That has historically had a very low rate of success. Um, so I think the other issue to think about is some of the specific logics of how they're supposed to work. So there's the logic that is going to hurt the Russian economy and say the Russian people will get angry at their government because their government is prosecuting a war which is costing them economically. The flip side of that is the Russian people feel that they're being punished and they rally around the flag is the term that's usually used, that instead they support their government because they stand with their government as these outsiders, these other countries are punishing them. And hey, it's not their fault. I mean, yes, it's their government's fault, but you know, they, they didn't start the war. Why are they being punished? So you can argue with that position on their part, but that is very often how people respond. Um, then there are sanctions that are meant to target people in the Russian government's inner circle, so wealthy people, the idea being that you know you take their yachts away, you take you freeze their money, you take their access to their money away, they're going to be horrified by this and they're going to put pressure on the government. Now the thing is though, you've sanctioned all of them, they can't access their money, they can't access their yachts, uh, they um, they become more dependent on the Russian government, not less. Uh, that's where all of their livelihood now comes from. Uh, and you've been telling these people that you're gonna put them on trial or whatever else, you've already sanctioned them. It's hard to understand, you know, some of them are opposed to the war, right? Some of these very wealthy people around the Putin government have quietly or more loudly spoken out against the war. But, you know, it's not something that, I don't think that happened because of the sanctions. Uh, I mean, I do think it happened because they see a disaster for Russia in this economically, politically, in every imaginable way. The other kind of sanctions that um, create a bit of a problem are sanctions that are actually policy. So when you impose sanctions that are meant to weaken and constrain the Russian economy uh, so that it can't rebuild its war machine, that's policy. If you're, your policy is to keep them from rebuilding their war machine. Now you might be willing to ease some of those sanctions, but other sanctions that are meant to limit the war machine, such as supplies of crucial um, electronics, you don't want to reverse until and unless you've decided you're comfortable with Russia rebuilding its war machine. Similarly, some of the energy related sanctions, they contribute to the European capacity to, be, to have more energy independence from Russia. So again, some of this can be eased because they're expensive and they're painful, but some of it is just part of a broader policy of limiting European energy dependence on Russia. So they're going to stay in place. And I think it's really important to think through what stays, what goes, and under what conditions to understand within these countries themselves what sanctions and what's policy, what's staying and what, and what could conceivably go. Because without that, you do find yourself in a situation where the sanctions, in fact, stay on forever. 
And if the sanctions are going to stay on forever, what possible incentive does Russia have to change its behavior? So one of the things one hears in countries that are not in Europe that are looking at this war and are looking at the European response to this war and maybe quite sympathetic to Ukraine and Ukrainians is a certain frustration, despite that sympathy, that, wait a second, you don't, what about Yemen? What about Afghanistan? What about Ethiopia? What about all of the crises and conflicts all around the world to which you don't pay any attention and some of which you, Europeans and Russians and everybody else, helped cause? Why is this so much more important? Uh, and the answer, of course, is from a human, uh, from a human standpoint, it is in no way more important. From a geostrategic standpoint, it is about the security of Kenyans and Colombians and South Africans and Vietnamese, because you do have a war that pits Russia, the country with the world's biggest nuclear arsenal, against Ukraine, which does not have nuclear weapons, but which is backed by NATO, which includes three countries, the United States, the United Kingdom, and France, which do. So the risks of escalation for this conflict are very, very global and very, very terrifying on a global level. The other aspect of this, of course, is that the implications of this conflict economically have already been global. Ukraine's incapacity to export the way it does in peacetime, the sanctions on Russia, which limit its ability to export, have created food insecurity um, in parts of the world that are used to getting wheat uh, from both of these countries. Um, a lot of other products uh, kind of fit into these categories of things that Russia and Ukraine together separately have been crucial to trade and now are cut out of it. And you know, there are ways to think about how to mitigate it in the case of um, those aspects of this problem that are a result of the sanctions on Russia. The Western countries imposing the sanctions have started to think about what they can do to help fill gaps and uh, to help uh, assist countries that are affected so that they are not punished uh, with the sanctions intended to punish Russia. Uh, in the case of getting exports out of Ukraine, there's also some thinking being done about whether there are ways to um, ship Ukrainian agricultural production, which is actually continuing despite the war, uh, to consumers. But you know, the, these are all critical responses, but it does speak to the fact that this is a global war.